Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Open Banking and Payment Systems, FinTech and Blockchain, Models, Ideals, and Challenges to Come. I'll turn it over to you, Eduardo, for introductions of you and the panelists and begin our session. Right, so um, hi, every hi, everyone. I'm really, really glad to be here, cited by so amazing persons uh, involved with this subject matter. So. Uh, I, I would love to uh, have your feedback afterwards and would we'll be totally free to discuss it later. But to start our panel, I uh, would like to introduce our panelists, okay, starting uh, from our women representative, uh, Ms. Nina Luisa Siedler. Uh, Nina is a partner at DWF, uh, a technology-oriented global law firm and she's head of the International Blockchain Comp Competence Group. She focuses on the legal implication of blockchain distributed ledger technology projects and assists her clients with structuring of businesses cases uh, with view to legal and regulatory compliance. Nina Siedler is active member of several associations and initiatives. Uh, I will just summarize the names. and. and and she, she's a member of the board of directors of Think Block Tank, IPDB, and Intabitan. Uh, cited, Nina is uh, by Jean-Luca Lorenzon. Jean-Luca is secretary for economic monitoring of Brazil. He is the responsible inside of the Ministry of the Economy to implement and to boost competition in as many as possible sectors of the national economy. Being the, financial, being the financial sector, uh, one of them. We have also um, Dr. João Manuel Pinho de Mello, a director of the Brazilian Central Bank. He is responsible for the creation and the implementation of the Brazilian Open Banking and Instantaneous Payment System. João is a, the former Secretary of Economic Monitoring during the previous administration. João is also a professor of economics at INSPER. And myself, a professor of economic law, legal professional for 20 years, and chairman of the Brazilian Institute for Competition and Innovation, IBCI, an open and not-for-profit think tank created from the joint initiative of a group of professors and researchers that preaches values of free enterprise, free competition, innovation, level playing field, for the construction of a fairer society with more social welfare and equality through how open markets solutions. About our panel, Brazil is launching a new set of regulations to open and bring more competition to the financial industry. This ambitious agenda, however, is subject to be gradually implemented and in principle, we depend upon the creation of a technological system and a set of operational rules, name it as, quote, convention by the regulation. Between the incumbents, who have no incentives, apparently, to truly collaborate to open the market for competition. The current banks, however, and upon such a regulation, will choose the technological tools, the basis, keys, and they are supposed to design the tech rules for the open and to determine the, the level of openness to such an ecosystem. So this panel uh, is built up over these five, five or six questions that I will try to summarize and pass the word to our first speaker. The first is how to design an open platform and allow its implementation, mitigating expected barriers to be raised by the current incumbents. How similar agendas played out in other countries? How an open blockchain could be raised as an alternative to a failure in this self-regulated, quote, plan A, present, to be presented by the current regulation or by the current incumbents in Brazil upon the regulation? Whether including more stakeholders into the elaboration of the convention would be desirable. Whether introducing compliance by design as requirement for incumbents and others to operate could also help. 
how can we make them accountable for the whole society, not only for their own inter interests? So this is the problem and so ambitious, uh, ambitious like the project. And I pass the word now to our first speaker, Ms. Uh, Mr. João Manuel Pinho. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen in five seconds. All right, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, as, a, as it's fit or good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like, uh, I'd really like to change Radical Exchange for the invitation, it's an honor. Uh, and it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to talk about this uh, very fundamental and strategic project that the, uh, the Brazilian government is uh, <clears throat> scaring that is uh, led by the central bank, but it's uh, uh, an, initi an initiative of, of the central bank and the National Monetary Council, which is composed of the central bank and the Ministry of the Economy. Uh, Eduardo has raised uh, uh, very interesting and, and relevant questions. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, I, I hope I will uh, uh, I will tackle at least a couple, if not three of them uh, during the presentation. If, and if I don't, please do ask me again because they are uh, truly important and strategic. So okay. open banking, uh, just to start off, open banking is inserted uh, uh, within the Brazilian central bank mission to promote a sound and efficient uh, financial system. The role of the, of the banking regulator here, which is in, in the case of Brazil, the banking regulator and the monetary, monetary authority are, are one and the same, is to support uh, pro-competitive uh, innovations uh, while of course, uh, ensuring uh, prudential soundness and making sure that all data protection procedures are, 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 are observed. Uh, some people believe that there is a tension, a trade-off between these uh, goals. Uh, we don't. Uh, we think they're complementary, not substitutes. Uh, we also perform supervisory, regulatory, uh, and resolution roles here, uh, which are important to set the context, uh, the background, for these uh, initiatives. What I mean is that when we think about uh, going through with open banking, we have to take into account on the plus side that we have a supervisory authority uh, and that means uh, sanctioning. And it goes, maybe goes to, to one of your questions uh, uh, a little hastily, Eduardo, but uh, one of the ways to make sure that everybody complies is to sanction of uh, regulated entities. Uh, and we also, uh, when we designed uh, the Open Bank Initiative, we also have to take into account that we have regulatory powers uh, to, in some case, uh, impose through, through regulatory means uh, uh, compliance and also resolution responsibilities because whatever it is that, that happens afterwards. And obviously innovation and competition may uh, produce and, and uh, imply resolution uh, actions. We have to take that into account. Uh, resolution, just meaning, uh, uh, said it more straightforward is just when a bank or a regulatory entity fails. Obviously we have to balance uh, and trade off the benefits of competition with, uh, with the safety of the system. Although I firmly believe that uh, there's, the tension here is not a first order concern. Uh, open banking will be implemented in four uh, phases sequentially. Uh, phase one will go live uh, November this year. 
and this is a rep uh, uh, a repository of uh, publicly available data about uh, participant institutions. That seems a little trivial, meaning this means that where are the bank branches, uh, what are the average interest rates that they uh, charge in different types of credit, uh, what are the fees that they charge for different types of packages. This sounds trivial, but just sharing this information is in and of itself very pro-competitive uh, and provides an initial uh, level playing field for uh, among uh, incumbents uh, and uh, entrants. Stage one, which will be launched uh, in uh, May uh, 2021, is the main bulk of customer transactions and registry information. Registry means uh, personal data uh, and, and, and customer transaction. Uh, transaction is uh, exactly what it, it suggests. Uh, all tra financial transactions done by, uh, by the individual. And here I have to pause and uh, clarify and emphasize that the Open Banking Initiative is completely consent-based. Uh, the structuring building block of Open Banking in Brazil is, the un is, is property rights. And it's the understanding that was set in law in our version of the General Data Protection uh, Directive uh, in our case, uh, Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados, uh, has established the principle that data belongs to the individual. And open banking is built upon this principle of property right. And therefore, it is the individual's right and decision whether or not to share it, uh, his or her financial data uh, among, uh, in this case, banks, payment institutions, credit unions, and other uh, regulated entities by the Brazilian Central Bank. It is completely consent-based. Uh, stage three is a payment initiation service. So this is our stage uh, three, which will be launched in August, is just to put it in context, this the equivalent of uh, the uh, PSD2, Europe's PSD2. Stage four will is the expansion of the scope of data to include among others foreign, foreign exchange transactions, investment, insurance, and, uh, and pension uh, plans. Uh, open banking is mandatory for the largest uh, incumbents, segments one and two. And it's voluntary to all other uh, authorized licensed institutions, but with reciprocity. That means that if you choose to participate in the Open Bank Initiative, you're a regulated entity and you choose to participate, you will also share your data. Again, uh, conditional consent by the individual. Uh, all participating institutions are responsible for reliability, integrity, availability, and security, and confidentiality of data. Institutions will be allowed to have partnerships with third parties, meaning non-regulated, to operate the open bank. Uh, it's mandatory to share data and services in a format that is convenient for public access and, and stage one. And participating institutions must ensure free access to public uh, information in stage one. What we call the convention, quote unquote, the convention will define access parameters to prevent abuse. And let me pause here because this goes to the heart of, the, of Eduardo's question. Uh, the key thing here is governance. Uh, we built a self-regulated, but assistance, assisted uh, governance uh, scheme, meaning that six different uh, entities, associations will have equal political powers in the convention. That means one seat for the 
let's say the association that is normally that it represents all banks, but it's normally, let's uh, say, associated with the largest banks. One seat for the association that is normally associated with uh, the uh, middle, middle-sized and smaller banks. Uh, one seat for the credit unions. Uh, one seat for payment, the association that is normally associated with the largest payment institutions. Uh, one seat for fintechs and one seat for smaller with the, the uh, association normally associated with entrant uh, payment institutions. And last but certainly not least and probably more important, what we mean by assisted is that the central bank does not have a seat but has veto power. Uh, and the central bank will arbitrate any uh, conflict or unsurmountable conflict that comes out of the convention. Uh, always having the goal of fostering competition, efficiency, and data security. Uh, open banking here will help to get the most out of uh, other strategies of the central bank. It's complementary to other strategies, such as increase the supply and quality of, uh, of collateral, facilitate access to new initiatives, such as our fast payments initiative and send initiative and sandbox, enhance the use of credit information uh, and interoperate digital services with payment infrastructure. Uh, I can go into more details later on the questions, but the core principle is property rights on data on the citizen side, customer empowerment, more competition, uh, greater role for all players, level playing field, and uh, making sure that competitive adv advantage here is not on the scale or capital or uh, any ad informational advantage, but on the service and the quality of the service and the price of the service that is provided. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, João. It was a very um, straight to the point presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I said that already, but I would emphasize um, the fantastic role that Brazilian Central Bank is historically doing in open this market in Brazil and trying to shift the, com the, com the competition from capital and mass uh, to innovation and better serving the society. Thank you very much. Um, My pleasure. Yes, our pleasure. Uh, we have some questions. I will pass the word to uh, our second speaker, and then I, I'm an optimistic person, so I believe we will be able to tackle all of them. Okay, so Jean, you have the word, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, first of all, good morning. Good morning to, to everyone uh, here, the speakers, and to everyone watching across the world. It's an honor, it's a pleasure actually, and also to be here in this conference. And this invitation, I mean, uh, it means a lot to, to be with such qualified speakers here in a Saturday morning. I mean, um, we uh, really want to, to, to engage in this kind of discussion. It's important for us, it's important to have cross sector uh, exchange of ideas, especially if we can get global visions and perspectives. So it's, it's really a pleasure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gaban. And uh, so I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context here of what are our challenges inside the ministry, because we are really concerned about any policies that impact the direct access to the credit market and to the general institutions and products of, of banks especially in the context of the pandemic. I mean, everything has changed and the game is different now, but it's still very, very important for us to, to challenge, I'm sorry, to, to uh, monitor and to follow on those policies that were planned before the pandemic, although our team has been mostly focused on, on those very specific measures. So uh, Brazil has a very concentrated market when it comes to its banking uh, sector. Uh, this should not be a surprise, I guess, for anyone. We do have a culture of traditional big banks that have dominated the sector, and that, and this reflects directly in the consumer uh, results. What is offered, especially in our spread, um, in our spread fee, that it's one of the largest in uh, 
in the world. So we do have a concern of how to challenge that. And this reflects directly in our competitiveness and of course, in our capacity to, to uh, get investment for those small and to those starting a business. For, because this is the main point in which they could rely as they do in other countries on their banking system. So it's a challenge and it has been a challenge to deal with this concentrated market during the pandemic. The ministry in partnership with the central bank has established a committee during the pandemic to better assist and to monitor what we call the critic sectors, which have been uh, around different stakeholders, but they concern majorly those sectors that more desperately needed credit and access to, to financial help and assistance during this, this time, mostly for, for paying their own, uh, for, for keeping on their, their financial obligations and duties on time. So we did have established that committee and that just showed us the most important uh, I, I guess the even more relevant and important discussion of this topic, especially for small businesses and to those uh, private consumers and, and people, because th there's a real difficult, uh, and it's a challenge to get credit to those people. It's been like two or three months in which have been designing different products and regulations, and the ministry has got direct involvement on it. We have launched a series of lines of, of uh, financial products, some supported uh, in partnership with another bank, some directly for our development bank. And this all just, again, just highlights the importance of, uh, of initiatives such as the open banking and the sandbox, regulatory sandbox that, that I guess uh, has uh, direct relations to development of new fintechs. So all of this, of course, talks with the asymmetry of information. So about the initiatives on, on themselves, right? Uh, talking about open banking, what can I say about open banking that João has already uh, not, not said? I mean, it's a fantastic job. We are truly admirers of, of the work of João and his team, uh, not only because he was previously in, in the secretary that uh, I'm currently on, uh, very recently actually, that since I've been here, but also because it's unprecedented uh, to promote this level of cooperation between different private banks uh, and for exchange of information and for exchange and for open and, uh, openness to competition. I mean, this is truly unprecedented and this is mostly, uh, mostly uh, a result of the hard work of the guys from Central Bank the ministry in itself is uh, as an urgent matter. It's very important for us that the pandemic not to be used as an excuse for it to be postponed. I think, I think we have a, a very good timeline of implementation. We are looking forward to monitor and to assist and anything that can be useful. There are some challenges, of course. I mean, the execution, the operation, uh, as they always say, the devil lies in the details. And I think it's, it's going to be very important to understand the particular behavior of the players, to understand exactly how the system is going to be designed, but we have full trust in the central bank. Uh, anyway, uh, it's important for us to understand which kind of practice, uh, just to give an example, in Brazil, sometimes we have such a complex regulatory system that most of the times our anti-competition conducts that we can be seeing that are resulting in different kinds of concentrations in general markets. I'm not talking about any specific sector. I'm not talking specific about the financial sector or the banking sector in itself. Uh, usually they are able to do it so for capture regulation. And that's because we have such a complex regulatory system or even of interpretation of regulations. They usually one company can kind of of direct its relationship with another. There's a, several cases that are ongoing investigation inside my department. And I guess this is this is kind of a, a, a practice that we have in Brazil more than a direct anti-competition uh, anti competition conduct by companies. So what's important for us here to understand how the players are gonna interpret the regulation, how they're gonna follow the regulation, 
how they're going to develop their actions and integrate within the main system. Uh, the digital system, of course, is very important for us and the design aspect of that, but it truly relies on the openness and transparency of the players. Um, um, we are, have full, uh, full confidence that the central banks can ensure this by their many, their many uh, instruments of regulation and including, if necessary, let's say hard, uh, hard acts uh, to, to enforce those regulations. Uh, about the fintech sector, I mean, it's extraordinary also the advances that the, 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 the central bank has done. I truly believe that the regulatory sandbox is a worldwide practice that has been uh, so successful in some place around the world, and it was due time to come to Brazil. Uh, I would highlight that this is not something only for the central bank. We have another, uh, especially on the, ins the private insurance market and the, the private pensions market, uh, ideas for, for regulatory sandboxes. And our department is fully committed to, to expand those ideas of regulatory sandboxes to other parts of the government, especially non-related to financial markets. Uh, this is such a, a great way to promote competition, especially in markets that have players that are well-established and this is something truly uh, concerning for us uh, as an as a urgent matter. Blockchain technology is also very important. I, I surprised everyone when I say a couple of weeks ago that our Brazilian, the equivalent of the Brazilian IRS, our revenue uh, collector is, is pretty interested in the technology. I mean, everyone inside the government is, uh, and its, it's possibilities are, are wonderful. Uh, we have to, say how, to see how the, the system plays out before we do that. Uh, of course, we also look very kindly to the additional market stakeholders. Uh, although we have always have an open, uh, a great relationship with the central bank. Uh, and finally, uh, um, the final challenge, I guess, is cross-sector data protection. I mean, we have been entering, and it's not just a change in our regulatory uh, systems. And here, talk more broadly about the, the data uh, law in Brazil but it's also a change of culture. It's a change of how we perceive the, the ownership of data and how players are gonna to behave towards it. It's, it. It implies a lot of costs to companies. So there has even been some, some challenges and, and some attempts to postpone the, the full enforcement of the data protection law that Juan, Juan mentioned. We are still waiting regulation from the authority that hasn't been established. We're waiting for that in the next weeks. Uh, hopefully, uh, it, it will be established before the, the, the first part of the laws come into effect because it, it, we have to change that. I mean, we, we have to understand uh, what it means for the consumer to be the, the, the owner of those data, and of, of, the, of its own data. And this is so important because it, it, it will reflect across different kinds of products and different kinds of markets. Overall, uh, again, I think this is such an amazing, amazing uh, action by the central bank to fully support it. And we are uh, uh, excited to see the, the first results and to understand how the players are gonna implement it. We have those concerns about their conduct and the digital system behind it, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see it as how to play out at least in the short, in the short, uh, in the short, short term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gianluca. And um, you were very into our time, actually. Nina has questions, others too, uh, but I will pass the word to Nina and then she can present and make her question and interact with us. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, thank you. Um, I will share my screen in a second. Um, yeah, I guess I represent um, the blockchain angle in, in this panel um, and um, will try to bring in the research undertaken in that context with regard to governance of network structures. Um, and I'm just thinking, just, just a second, uh, I don't see the right screen. You need my help, you let me know, please. Yeah, just just a uh, just a second. I just need to jump between two uh, screens here. That's what I wanted to show. 
All right. So um, just very brief. Um, I just picked this up uh, right now. Um, we, we in, in the blockchain space, it's all about uh, how do networks organize themselves. And there is a part that is done on chain. Um, and that part is like shown in, in this um, uh, slide. Uh, where we distinguish between the access side, right? If, if a network can be um, accessed by the public or only by private um, and, and what you seem to build with the um, open banking system surely will be on, on the private side here. And then the question who runs actually the network, that's the validation question. And there we distinguish between permissioned and permissionless. And you know, on the blockchain side, typically the famous Bitcoin, Ethereum networks, they are all permissionless. But if we are talking about um, industry networks, uh, specifically also um, with um, confidential data, like in the banking area, you will typically find permission ones, right? So we are playing on the right-hand side and presumably on the right-hand lower uh, side, what we call consortium um, blockchains or alike. So yeah, you, you could make use of that for your purposes. And then you need to think about, and that's what I would be very interested uh, in, in learning, uh, Joa, um, how did you organize that body where you just um, talked about having seven representatives of the industries and how do they, these representatives actually get into their roles and functions? And, and that is a part of the like off-chain governance, which we also see in the blockchain context and where we typically distinguish between three basic models. Um, the first one, which had been explored um, famously by the Ethereum Foundation, is the foundation model. Foundation uh, is a type of um, institution or entity which is an orphan. It hasn't got any members or shareholders, right? So it's put on autopilot when it's created, and then uh, it's administered uh, by its executives. That actually, uh, at least from my point of view, had not been proven a good concept because if specifically if we are talking in the high-tech area, um, uh, things change too much. So this autopilot concept within a foundation didn't play out well. So the, the newer uh, consortia are rather using either uh, associations which have members which can change and which can also change the direction of the association or if they are playing more in the for-profit field, uh, then they are using uh, co-ops for that purpose. Um, so I would be very much interested in, in, in learning how you actually design that body that um, you created for your open banking platform. And I'm sure that there are tons of initiatives in the blockchain space where you could get you know further ideas for the governance for because you know the the blockchain governance topic is all about coordinating uh, networks of many many participants and in that context i would like if you permit um briefly introduce uh, a global uh, association i hope you see the blue screen now yeah all right um, which is uh, called INATBA, and um, Eduardo, you already mentioned, I'm uh, at the board of directors within that association, which had been initiated by the European Commission uh, end of um, 2018, and then finally had been formed um, in uh, 2019 with you know, a, a great variety of players in the blockchain space, um, from large industry to um, very small uh, startups, micro entities, and including obviously all sorts of associations and foundations out there in the blockchain space. So the European Commission really envisaged that the need for the blockchain industry to get together and to discuss specifically also governance questions. Um, so I, I don't want to waste too much time here. Um, I'm sure um, that Radical Exchange will be happy to share the um, presentation that we, we sent over to them. But what I think is, is very important, and that's the invite um, to the Brazilian community here, 
um, we INATPA is organized in a three set way. We have the membership, with, which is the industry. Uh, we currently have nearly about 200 members. Um, and then we accomplished that with a governmental advisory body, which is a part that um, the European Commission put actually into our articles of association um, and the academic advisory body. So the INATPA organization is basically all around creating communication channels between these three sectors, governments, academics, and, and private sector. Um, and that's a rough overview. We are still very Europe-centric um, here, uh, but we really aim to get more um, members, specifically also from the Americas, into INAPA. Um, just a couple of member names, and maybe that's of interest specifically to you two, Joa and um, John Luca. We really invite you if you want to get closer to the discussions taking place in the DLT and blockchain space to join our governmental advisory body and get into exchange um, within the um, several. Um, governmental representatives, and here is the list. So we started with the international ones, um, United Nations groups, um, the the World Bank, World Trade Organization, and now are including more and more also national representatives of governments, typically uh, ministries of economics or finance, and also central banks into this round. And then we have the academic advisory body, and that's just an overview. It's larger currently than the, um, than the governmental advisory body. Um, and we now start, uh, we have 14 working groups, um, and one of which is also the governance working group. So that was an open invitation to all of you to join us in this effort to bring it all together. Um, and I would very much look forward to actually having a couple of minutes left to learn more um, how you built the governance for the open um, banking in Brazil. Many thanks. Well, thank you very much, Nina. And um, it was a very good presentation. Uh, well, I'm really glad to, I feel myself included in such an invitation, although I'm not an authority, you know, maybe on the academic side of it. Sure, yeah. absolutely, but, absolutely. We'll stay in touch with regard to that. Of course, and uh, I am really glad also that we have this opportunity to uh, join so such important persons like João and Jean uh, to hear uh, these ideas and, uh, and from an expert like you that you do see uh, blockchain and as an alternative. Uh, for what we are thinking of opening the market here for competition in a responsible manner. João made it very well. It's, we should be responsible because we are dealing with like the lives of dozens of persons. So it's it's very important. But we have, you all can see the questions from the others, I, I presume, right? Uh, no, you can't, Jean. No. I can I can see the questions on uh, on Word document, right? On on yes, Google, on Google Docs. Yes, yes. Uh, we have we have like tw uh, twelve minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if um, João seems to be the main target for, uh, of the audience. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, João will be. We have enough time to uh, answer all questions, but you can choose one or two, João, and then you can we, we can hear a little more uh, Jean Luca and Nina as well. Uh, I'm. Enjoying very much the panel. So, João, please feel free to choose one or two and then you can tackle them. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, I'll try and, you know, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I, I can see that your contact information was at the very last uh, slide. So, I'll, I'll, I'll email you. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be a pleasure. Uh, first, on Nina's question, uh, what we call the, the convention is, is, is a somewhat of an abstract entity which is uh, a high level committee uh, with equal political rights on, on this uh, seven associations. There will be, there is a structure of or, or, or more uh, down to earth uh, technical committees that will decide on, on, or on the technicalities, which are pretty important. Let's say the technology, uh, 
but also on the principles of, uh, of the journey of consent and uh, on uh, re re recuperating costs above and beyond what we have already set in, in regulation that will be uh, free of charge. So especially the, the, the journey of consent and the plumbing of how to expose uh, the AIPs is uh, it's pretty important here. Uh, obviously, there might be some, uh, let's say, uh, conflicting interests within the, the convention, and it's our job to arbitrate them, having in mind as a, uh, the ultimate goal, which, which is to foster competition innovation. And this, the, the ultimate goal is actually to deliver value for, for consumers of uh, banking uh, services. Uh, Evidently, in a in, in a, a safe way, because we are dealing with uh, personal data that can be sensitive. Let's. Uh, I think we have to uh, to face it straight through. Uh, I will. I, I I probably won't have time for all the questions. There are great questions here. Let me just uh, let me address a couple of them. Uh, it is a not. Uh, in system, uh, and that means concretely that consumers will have to give consent at a certain frequency. This will be determined by the convention. Wh whether a certain frequency is at, at every single transaction or daily, uh, what I can tell you uh, straight away is that it's not an open-ended consent which you give consent once and then it's done. And then you opt out after that. No, uh, you will have to consent pretty much every time. Uh, and then the question that those are, there are actually two questions in, within one. Uh, I believe that, again, it's a consumer's choice. You may not consent and then you don't share your data. Uh, we firmly believe that in, in many circumstances, it, it will be on the consumer's uh, interest to do so because by, by sharing your data, uh, you get uh, more players to compete for your business, uh, and more players uh, having access to the same uh, type of data that allows them to underwrite credit uh, and underwrite risk. So, uh, so that it's beneficial for the consumer. But if the consumer or if the individual feels that well, the costs outweigh the benefits, you, you just don't consent. Uh, very quickly, when I said phase three, and I, yeah, it's an analogy to the payment system directive two of Europe, it's basically payment initiation, okay? Uh, meaning that uh, every authorized uh, entity will be able to initiate payment, whether you have a bank account, whether for instance, you have a transactional account with that entity or not. Imagine that you have a, your, 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 your bank is X, let's say, uh, Barclays, but you may use an app from another uh, bank or payment institution to initiate payment, and you can and you can do through there, and you can do it with non-regulated entities as well. Uh, but they will have to have an agreement with a regulated entity, and the reason is, uh, again, we we're striking balances here, uh, and uh, our coercive, we, we're dealing with. Uh, data, and obviously we have to envision and anticipate uh, different types of, of, of behavior that are not conducive to to competition. Uh, so we have to have we have to have course of power uh, to induce, uh, uh, which is in general is true, but obviously to induce good behavior. So that's why non-regulated entities will have to work through a regulated entity. Uh, and then there will obviously be decisions on, on, on the boundaries of the regulated ecosystem uh, if uh, this working through regulated entities produces some, some type of competitive disadvantage. And this, these are decisions that will be taken along the way. I think of, uh, I, don't, I don't think I have questions, time for more questions without not giving the opportunity of uh, Jean-Luc and Nina also uh, reacting to 
questions and comments. Thanks. Okay, great, you're great. Okay, Sean, Nina, maybe Jean has something to say. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that the, the questions were mainly directed to, to Juan, and, but I, I would just follow up about, again, the importance of it. I'm, I'm going to give a case example. Uh, we have struck a, a, a policy a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually, there was a financial line designed to help, uh, to help companies to finance their payroll. And that was very important. I mean, it was even before the government offered to, to pay the salary for those staying at home. And what happened, uh, and the government put uh, over uh, 20 billion uh, reais on it directly from our treasury. So what happened is since every, the, the rules of the program was were in which the company could only uh, ask for the financial assistance from the institution that uh, for which they already did their payroll payments. And that simply was not working fully. I mean, the because there was no competition between different banks to offer the product to guarantee that the client would get it. Uh, because only one could have the, that information. So, I mean, this, this, this case example that we had uh, just in early uh, April, late March, shows the importance of exchange of information between different institutions. Uh, of course, there are concerns about their protection, but they are already being addressed. But, I mean, the overall importance of it, uh, it's, it's going to be good for the consumer. And I think that Juan, uh, it's, it's really right on his point when he says that uh, it's important not to have an open-end agreement, but at the same time, it has to be uh, clear enough for the consumer, to, the benefits for him, uh, spe specifically because in the end, it's again, it's again, it's, it's about designing the best system, but a safe system. And so uh, I, I guess this is it. All right. Ms. Nina? Yeah, um, yeah, I think there is quite an overlap between the discussion about, you know, um, the, the conflict between uh, data protection on the one hand side and the, the protection of the financial uh, area, specifically anti-money laundry and, and those things on the other hand. And um, any given system that you implement in the financial sector will need to balance those two things, right? And that's... Uh, that's, I think, a, a very important goal to keep in mind. All right. Well, uh, we are running ahead, reaching our, uh, our final end. And I would like to thank you all for this uh, very productive discussion. And maybe i like to leave, um, to finish this with sharing some ideas to the future. Uh, to the central bank and to the secretary of, of economy here monitoring uh, maybe um, to uh, take care about a truly um, representation of stakeholders uh, in this formation of this convention maybe we should go a little go a little down to the ground towards the grounds and see um, or re establish the requirements to to be a representative right uh whether these six persons or six institutions really represent the, those stakeholders and maybe uh joan it's only an idea uh in pencil okay so maybe uh central bank could consider inviting maybe the, the secretary of economy to stay there as well to help you in building up this um uh, to the ground rule about representation, maybe. Uh, our, my idea as a citizen is to have, is to be represented there, not, not owning a bank, you know. And I don't see, to finish, uh, I don't see, uh, of course, uh, overlaps and tensions are always present when we enforce the law anyway, in anywhere. Uh, but I don't see actually a tension between data protection and the financial system and the results for consumer welfare because ultimately consumer will allow beforehand sharing of his or her data. So if the consumer is allowing 
if he or she is presumable um, aware of the risks because he wants or she wants the benefits. So that's how, that's how I see my decision-making process. And that's how I see any uh, reasonable, reasonable person decision-making processes. Okay, so thank you all uh, again. Any final remarks? If you don't have final remarks, we may, we may finish. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. It was a pleasure and privilege. Thank, thank you again also for the invitation. It's an extraordinary event. And thank you for the speakers for the amazing insights. Thank you, everybody.